learning from Jesus through exercise, yoking up with Jesus, and learning while we work the field, and casting out laborers. You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net, Rocks of Revelation being poured out to you. Today's going to be a little bit different. I'm taking some audio from a Facebook Live um, video that I did. So you're probably going to hear a couple of pops and cracks that I didn't quite get out of the audio. Um, You'll probably hear some weird comments like, oh, this person's in the room and you know, so forth. Cause people, when you watch me on Facebook live, people come in and they comment and it's kind of like a, uh, a real time conversation. It's pretty cool. But anyway, I'll have the link to the video in the show notes and, you know, forgive me for the quality of the audio, but it's the content that's, that we care about. Uh, we're going to be talking about some really good content. You probably want to bookmark this podcast, maybe even download the podcast, because there's some good stuff in here. And the reason I did a Facebook Live video, quite honestly, I was having a really tough time uh, doing a podcast that day. I was going for prayer walks, and and then just all sorts of stuff happened in my uh, personal life, and I'm like, I'm like sitting down, and I felt like the Lord drawing me to do a Facebook Live video. So, and uh, you know, I never, I didn't know what was going to happen. I'm like, going, this is pretty good. Let's make a podcast out of it. So, here you go. Without further gabbing, here is the podcast. Lifting up the name of Jesus at conradrocks.net. What's up, everybody? It's Conrad from conradrocks.net. Rocks of Revelation being poured out to you. You might want to save this. You might want to share it as well. And it's something I've learned through experience, and it's also biblically correct. And when I say biblically correct, one of the things that I want to emphasize is everybody says sola scriptura you know everybody says i've got the monopoly on what the bible means remember this one guy he was coming over to this bible study and uh he was teaching eschatology which is which is end time stuff and i'm like hey you know which which one are you dude you know which position are you he goes i'm the the biblical position i'm like okay (laughs) so we need to be led by the spirit of truth and let me let me before i get into this teaching let me just kind of show you what I'm talking about, okay? We have Gamaliel, we have the Pharisees and all that stuff, the Sadducees. These people memorize the Bible. You know, they started teaching their kids at six years old to memorize Leviticus. Doug Hansen, good to see you. And um, anyway, so at that, you know, by the time they're 13, you know, hopefully they have the Torah memorized and then they continue on. But the thing is, all this deduction and stuff did not... They couldn't predict the Messiah or when he was coming. Now, 2,000 years later, we can use our carnal mind, our rational thinking, and go, oh, yeah, he was numbered with the transgressors. That's a no-brainer. Jesus was crucified with some thieves. He was buried in the, with the wicked. Oh, okay, he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Think about going forward. Could you predict that Jesus would be buried in a tomb of a senator? Could you predict that he he would be crucified. I mean, there's, there's one prophecy. They pierced his hands and feet, you know, and, and another translation in Hebrew is like, uh, uh, like a lion, my, my hands and feet. I mean, you know, there's no, you have to, you have to go in the Hebrew a little bit, but, but the thing is they had the Bible memorized. They could not predict the Messiah. They completely ignored Isaiah 52 and 53 and Psalms, you know, all these prophecies that that pretty much led up in the countdown from Nehemiah's wall. They ignored this stuff, and when Jesus showed up, they had the wrong picture. And they're saying, sola scriptura. So we need to be humble when we're teaching people. I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, James, is it James 3.1? Be not many teachers because you guys are in trouble. <laughs> you know, we need to we need to kind of like preface everything we do with humility because we don't. Yeah, here we go. James 3 1. 
My brethren, be ye not many masters, which in rabbi, you know, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. You know, so we should not act like we have a monopoly on truth. I mean, in all honesty, I, sometimes I feel like we're just a bunch of sheep looking at the butt of other sheep and going, okay, well, that sheep, there's some butts going that way. We need to lift our head and follow the Spirit and see the Master, see Jesus. He's the shepherd. We need to look up. The sheep know his voice and go, oh, cock our ear. That's the Spirit of truth guiding us into all truth. Okay, so, you know, we're all personally accountable. I think it's 2 Corinthians 5.10. I'm going to tell you something, man. Um, we need to read the Bible for ourselves because it's self-defense against false doctrine. There's so much false doctrine going around, like going, oh my gosh, this is just like, ah. When you read the Bible and you go, oh, well, gee, they're just, they're, this, this is wrong. But you just keep reading the Bible and the Spirit of Truth will, will teach you. And when I say 2 Corinthians 5.10, this is Paul talking to the Corinthian church. This is Paul the Apostle talking to Christians. He says, for we, including himself, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what you have done, whether it be good or bad. So, you know, salvation is the beginning. Everybody's worried about getting saved and that's just the beginning of the journey if that's if you're not worried about getting other people saved then you might not be saved yourself i mean check your heart jesus tries the reins of our hearts and the fruit you know our works is fruit i hate saying you know jesus talks a lot about works we're in the the uh, in Christian Chat on Voxer, we're talking about the letters of the seven churches. And Jesus keeps mentioning works. I know your works. You need to go back to the first ones. You know, like the ones in Acts. Back to Acts, amen? So anyway, this is something I want to share with you guys. That's, that's an amazing thing that Susan and I have learned by following what the Bible says. And it's really, it's really cool, and it's kind of like, wow, I didn't even know this was in the Bible type thing. And then you go, wow, this, this is awesome. Um, it's Hebrews 5.14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Okay, you know how Paul's always talking about, I gave you milk, and you guys can't handle meat. Jesus himself, he spent three and a half years with the disciples. And he says, man, there's many things I would like to tell you, but you can't bear them now. He was with them all the time. Amen, Ronnie. He was with them for three and a half years. And they daily, not we go in once a week and listen, can't even ask a question. You might get shot if you raise your hand, right? He was with them daily on the job training. And they still couldn't handle it. They needed the spirit of truth. So, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those by who reason by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This scripture has actually played a large part in my life. And I'm like going, oh, I was kind of doing this and learning it. And this is interesting, okay? You, the milk thing, people feed you milk, right? When you're learning, you're fed milk like a baby. You're drinking milk. You must be born again to see. You're like a baby on your bed. You go, hey, all you can do is you can see the kingdom of heaven, right? And then you mature. You know, except you become as little children, you can in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. So there's this maturity process that happens, right? So you go from milk to meat. You want to drive daddy's car, but you're not old enough nor mature enough until he says, here's the keys, son, right? Then we get into the little Johns. Uh, I forget exactly where, but I quote it quite a lot. He says, you know, you need that no one teach you have the unction, the Holy One, to guide, you know, to, to guide you into all truth. It's first John chapter two. And it's I'm just gonna go to it. This is the point where he talks about young children, young men, you know, you've overcome. He's talking about levels of spiritual maturity. Okay, and I'm going to get to the strong meat thing. And I think we were talking about this in the kind of, I was talking about it in the Christian chat over here on Voxer. These things I've written to you concerning him that seduce you, but the anointing which you've received of him abideth in you. You know, Jesus says, we're going to make our abode in you. We will make our dwelling in you. But the anointing which you've received of him abides in you, and you need not that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. So here's the interesting thing. John, the Apostle John, the Revelator, is teaching people that they no longer need a teacher. This kind of reminds us of the examples 
of how the prophetic people in Corinthians, he says, well, you know, you got some prophets, you guys get over here in two or three, and then one of you guys prophesy and the other couple judge. This is called mentorship. We have no prophetic mentors in the church now. I mean, I'm, I'm talking widely speaking. It's not even allowed, okay? We're not even allowed. So, so that, by golly, we're not going to have two or three gathering in the church to mentor one another. And this mentoring is kind of like what's happening with John here. He's going, you know, uh, he's got probably Polycarp, which is really cool because Polycarp writes about how he was hanging out with John. Says, hey, man, you know, if I don't understand the scripture, I'll just go over and talk to John. Man, wasn't that cool? So anyway, a Polycarp could be one of the people he's talking about here. He goes, yeah, you got it. You don't need it. Polycarp was martyred for the sake of Christ, too. You can read it in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Really good book. So there's this maturity. And then John's checking them against the Word, and he's checking them against the Spirit. Apostle John was checking them against the Word and the Spirit, because they both agree. Okay, The Spirit never violates the Word. The way I look at that, I look at the Spirit and the Word like the Word's the corral. And I look at the Spirit. You know how in Zechariah it says, these are the spirits, the horses, you know? They go out. Well, they don't jump over the fence. They stay, you know, they, they go around and do what they want, but they don't go over the fence. Okay, so that's kind of how I deal with it in my head. Then in this Hebrews 5.14, check it out, okay? But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age. So we're going from milk, sozo, being born again, where you're a little baby and people are spoon feeding you. Then you become a little child. You can enter the kingdom of heaven. Then, you know, he talks about all this maturity in, in John. Um, in these letters, my little children, yeah, he talks about all that. I've written to you fathers because you've known him. He talked about their maturity in 1 John 2. So then they're at meat. Then, but how did they get to the meat? How did they get to the meat? This is the cool part. Even those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The deal is, they go from the baby, they go to the child, and he's talking about the spiritual maturity of the of the believers, up to fathers even. Then he says you need that no one needs you. Uh, you need that no one teach you. You have the spirit of truth to teach you. So he's talking, he's just teaching them that they no longer need a teacher. Now, how did they get to full age? By reason of use. Now, in Romans 8 and 9, I think uh, Paul says, you know, you need to walk after the spirit, dude. I'm telling you, walking is not something, it's not sitting on the couch. It's putting one feet after the other. And um, then Paul says some crazy things, man. Remember, he had the Bible memorized. He keeps quoting scripture and says things like this, you know, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And in Romans 8, 1, the King James rendering, there's now therefore no condemnation to, to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So a Christian is supposed to walk a Christian is supposed to walk after the Spirit. So here we have in Hebrews 5.14, strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, who by reason of use or have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So let's give you an example, okay? Have you ever been in Walmart? I mean, I know Walmart's actually a ministry ground, man. We prayed there many times. But the thing is, you hear the Spirit of God, and he's saying, go tell that person about Jesus, you know? It ain't the devil that's going to do that. So we need to we need to have the spirit of pride. I mean, spirit of pride, boldness and humility to go out and do it. We need to be willing to look stupid for Jesus. Boldness and humility. Boldness because and, and humility. And you know what? Faith works by love. Let me. Let me I'm going to give you something else. Now this is going this is going to provoke you a little bit. Okay, check it out. Faith works by love. It doesn't work by pride. Pride is the sin of the devil. If you know that person's going to hell and you're afraid of your feelings getting hurt or looking stupid, then you have more pride than you do love for that person. Okay? Faith works by love. You know if you don't love that person, you're not going to do nothing. And if you know what you've done to the least of these my brethren, you've done unto Jesus. I know that kind of stings, but think about it. We need to put things in perspective, in God's perspective. Put on God's glasses when we look at things. Now, the next verse, okay, so here we go. 
by whose reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know, this is the next part. As we go out and minister to people, sometimes we'll walk by a lot of people, and then there'll be that one. And that, and that one, we go, yeah, that's, that's him or that's her. It's like God puts a mouse pointer over or lights them up or something, you know? Then all of a sudden you have, like, words for them, you know? But we know that from doing it. You're never going to know if you don't do it. You're never going to know. And I'm going to tell you what, the younger you are at this, God will give you some super duper grace. Amen. And there's many times, there's many times I haven't been led by the spirit. And, you know, I'm just going to be honest. I'm like, you know what? I have a scriptural mandate to preach the gospel to every creature. And it doesn't say, wait till you feel good, feel a mouse pointer from the Lord. He doesn't say that, you know? So I'm like, well, I'm, I'm supposed to talk to one person about Jesus every time I go to the store. Lady, you're it. <laughs> You know, I've done that before, and it wasn't anointed at all. And, and you know what? She didn't shoot me. She didn't do nothing. You know, and sometimes it turns out to be pretty doggone cool. Sometimes, you know. So be willing to look stupid, and after you do that a few times, it's real. It's, it becomes real easy. It becomes, it becomes real easy. Like yesterday, we was walking up. Man, we found the one. I'm going to tell you what happened. Okay, this is pretty awesome. Okay. I, we were about to go out and we went to church and we were about to go out. We had lunch and I had a vision of seeing this man, William at the park. William is a man I know. He's a homeless guy at the park and we go pray with him and talk to him and, and stuff. And I know where he sits. I know exactly which park he's at and I know exactly where he sits. And this is how God has done me more than once. So we go to that park exactly where William sits and William was not there. But guess what? There was a lady there, a homeless lady, reading her Bible when we walked up. We talked to her about Jesus and prayed for, for a long time. And the, the anointing happened so strongly, it went up a level. You know what I'm saying? When you're in the Spirit and you're supposed to be doing what you're doing, it's like the gifts are increased. It's like you you expand or something. I don't know. It's just you walk, you operate at a higher uh, word of wisdom and word of knowledge. It was pretty awesome. You know, she needed it, and it was a it was a divine appointment. Then she goes, "Oh, those guys over there, they need a word." I'm like, "Okay, I'm gonna go over there." And dude, I'm at this point now. Then I just wonder what God's going to do next. I I like to just I just it's kind of like just pushing a button and see what happens. You know, that's what I do now. We're going up to these four men, and. Uh, we went up there and I, we started ministering to them about goodie bags and stuff like that. And, you know, they're not going to, we're in America. They're not going to beat you up. You know, you want to pray for somebody? You want to talk to them about, you, what are the odds you get? I mean, do it. Jesus told us to do it, whether you're anointed or not. Go and do it. But I'm going to tell you, this scripture here, I'm learning. Even those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. After you do this a few times, after you have the vision of William at the park, you'll know like the man at Macedonia, okay? When Paul, in Acts chapter 16, he had a scriptural mandate to go preach the gospel to every creature, but you'll notice in Acts 16, the Holy Spirit prevented him. Wait a minute. The Holy Spirit prevented Paul from doing a scriptural mandate? Huh? You know, it doesn't make sense. Paul had a scriptural mandate to preach the gospel to every creature, but the Holy Spirit prevented him. Okay? Then he has a vision. A man from Macedonia comes up in the vision in the middle of the night, and he gets everybody up, goes, I heard from God, let's go. Poof, we're off to Macedonia. The first thing he does, okay, God wanted him in Macedonia. The first thing Paul does you know, the guy that says, I suffer not a woman to, to teach or have authority over others, is he starts a church basically with women. If you read the whole thing, they go to a river where there's want to be prayer, and, and Paul can't find a man, but he finds a woman, and then the whole household gets saved. Well, the story even continues on further. He casts out a demon. Remember, she had a puthon or a python spirit, a spirit of divination. And, you know, three days... He finally casts that demon out, and then he gets thrown in a Macedonian jail. And the jailer, remember, the jailer was going to kill himself after God was setting him free, and that man in his household got saved too. So that's how God works. You'll get a vision, 
It ain't going to make sense to your carnal mind. You follow the Spirit. It's like the glory cloud, yo. It's like stop looking at other sheep's butts and look at the shepherd. Amen? Listen for the shepherd. Follow him. Don't look at the other sheep's rear ends. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and then Paul gets over there, and the Macedonian jailer gets, gets uh, saved, him and his household. So see? That's how that works. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Now, here's the other scripture before I close the broadcast here. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Now, here's another thing that goes hand in hand with this. When we meditate in the precepts, we meditate in them both. Push them, pull them, let the Lord, you know, you start putting them together, and then the Spirit comes in and teaches you what it means. But guess what? We learn a lot from doing. Now, check it out. Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine. 29. Cool stuff, man. Building the kingdom type stuff. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in yourselves. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke is that thing they put around their neck. It's for an animal. It's an instrument to be worn while you're working the field. It's not worn sitting on the couch clicking with your remote. When do you learn? When you got the yoke on you. What? Who are we going to learn from? Jesus. (gasps) Isn't that awesome? So if you look at both of those scriptures there, we become mature by reason of use, senses, having our exercises sense both to, both to discern good and evil. Jesus is good. Amen. We're working the field. And then Matthew eleven twenty eight, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. We learn as we go, man. You're not going to learn sitting on the couch with your remote complaining if the shack is a heretical movie or not. <laughs> I had to say that, man. I had to. You guys are talking about that right now. Just go do it. Just go do it. Doug, Doug's here in the comments. He's down here in the Gulf Coast. He's always going out from praying for people, man. He'd be happy. To, you guys want to go out? Susan and I go out. Uh, you know, we, we go to the bus station, whatever. There's many people down here on the Gulf Coast that I know. Johnny, Gaston, another one. I mean, just, just hit me up. And you know what? There's a lot of people probably in your area. That, that are willing to go out. Pray walk your neighborhood. Uh, Doug Hansen has a really good uh, point here by Reinhardt Bunky. Reinhardt Bunky said that as you enter the harvest field, the tools will be issued as you enter the field, not sitting on the couch. That's really good. Yeah, that's really good. And uh, if you like this, please share this with your friends. You know, I want to encourage you. I'm going to pray for you before I stop here. Because we're here to build the kingdom. Amen? That's, we're not here to have our name in lights. We're not here to build my ministry. We are here to build that your will in heaven be done on the earth. That's what we're here for. That's what we're all about. Amen? Father God, I thank you for the people that are watching this, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that that you're touching them, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for a spirit of boldness, Lord. Right now, Lord, I pray for a spirit of boldness. Lord, I pray for a spirit of compassion, Father God. I pray for a very real sense that there are people dying and going to hell within a thousand feet of the people that I'm talking to right now. Lord, I pray that instead of a convicting sermon and going, wow, I'm really convicted about that sermon and sitting on the couch and doing nothing about it, and forgetting. It's like a man looking in the mirror and forget what they just heard, forgetting what the Word of God has just shined on their face. Lord, I pray that you dwell in them richly like the Word says. You will come and make your abode in us. Jesus, you said you will even manifest yourself to the believer. Amen? Father God, I thank you, Lord, that you manifest yourself to the believer. Inspire them inspire them. God breathed into Adam, and he was just a bunch of dead clay until that spirit animated, Numa animated Adam to move. Check this out. This is pretty interesting. I'm going to prove it to you. Pray the Lord of the harvest send out laborers. Y'all going to laugh at this? Because I, when I found this, I'm like, no way. This is one of the reasons I like to get to the original Greek of a word. 
Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Well, check it out, man. In the Greek, send forth is Greek 1544, ekbalo. It means to eject, to cast out, to expel, to leave, to pluck. It's the same word they use for casting out demons. Cast. It's used 50 times as the word cast. It's only used three times as the word send. I mean, this is why Christians are lazy, man. This is why they had to be persecuted in Jerusalem so they go spread the gospel. We have this, we have this uh, idea to just sit around and do nothing, but the Lord of the Harvest is supposed to cast them out. So he's like, you know, they're going to have to have some persecution, or they're just going to stay in Jerusalem on the couch watching TV. Amen? So that's why that happens. So, Lord, I pray, Father God, Lord of the Harvest, that you cast out some laborers to work the field. Amen? Let's not paint the barn and pray for the crops to come in. Hey, let's have a better program in the barn. Let's have a better program. Let's paint it. Maybe maybe it'll be attractive to the corn. No, man. People aren't going to go into the people aren't going to just go into your building. That's it's kind of like a, a thief walking into a police station. You gotta go get them. You gotta go get them, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being in my life. If this has touched you, please remember to share this with your friends and family and save this. This is good stuff. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.